A fundamental teaching of the Christian faith is the second coming of Jesus, that Jesus will literally one day return to this earth. The question is, have you been reading the signs of his coming? And are you ready for this unprecedented event? Hello, I'm Christine Dark. Throughout the Old Testament, there's a recurring theme, the Messiah is coming. So in the New Testament, we discover not only he has come, but also he's coming again. While most professing Christians look for the Lord to return, they often differ greatly over the details surrounding his second coming. The scriptures speak of a millennial reign of Messiah when Jesus will rule this world for a thousand years from Jerusalem. I can't wait for that day. The premillennial view looks for the Lord to come in order to establish a literal kingdom on earth over which Jesus will reign for 1,000 years. The post-millennial view holds that Messiah will return at the end of the millennial kingdom. Through the spread of the gospel, the world will continue to get better and better until the church conquers the world, so to speak. Jesus will return to judge the world, sending the wicked to hell and the righteous to their reward. I don't personally believe this post-millennial view is realistic because obviously this world is not getting better. But there's a third view, the amillennial view, that believes that Messiah has been reigning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords ever since his ascension to heaven, which in a sense, of course, is true, and that he will return to raise the dead, judge the world, and usher in the new heavens and the new earth. But all millennialists do not believe in a literal millennial kingdom as the Bible teaches. Followers of this view hold that Christ currently reigns in the hearts of Christians and that there's no need for a physical reign of Messiah on earth. The future reign, they say, with our Messiah, described in Revelation 20, is considered to be ruling with Christ in heaven and not on earth. But because there are definite Bible promises to Israel that must yet take place in a future millennial kingdom, the amillennial view holds that the promises to Israel have been usurped. They've been transferred to the church. And this is a heresy called replacement theology that claims that God is finished with Israel because they rejected their Messiah and that God will never give them a second chance. That is heresy if you take all the Bible prophecies into account. So I prefer the premillennial view, believing that the Lord will return and set up his kingdom to rule from Jerusalem for a thousand years. But of course, in this program, we will not dare attempt to set a date for his coming. But we will insist, according to the Bible, on the certainty of the second coming of Jesus. On that certainty, all true Christians should agree, whether you're pre, post, or amillennial. After all, the Lord himself said he will come again. At the Last Supper, before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus made this promise that he would return as he comforted his disciples. And it's recorded in John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 3. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The Lord's return was also proclaimed by angels when he ascended into heaven. We see that in Acts chapter 1 in verses 9 to 11. The two men in white apparel said, this same Jesus who was taken up into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. 
Our Lord's second coming was also proclaimed by the apostles. The apostle Peter in his second recorded sermon said in Acts chapter 3 verses 19 to 21, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Messiah Yeshua who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things. The Apostle Paul mentioned the second coming of Jesus many times in his epistles. For example, Paul taught in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, verse 26, that as often as we eat the bread of communion and drink the holy cup of communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And to the certainty of the Lord's second coming, we can add biblical descriptions of the manner of his return. It's important to note that he will come in person because Acts 1.11, which I just read a while ago, proclaims this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 to 17 proclaims that the Lord himself will descend from heaven and he will come with the clouds as we heard in Acts chapter 1. This same Jesus will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven, referring to verse 9 in that chapter, because he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he's coming in the clouds. Again, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17 that those who are alive and remain and the dead will be raised and meet the Lord in the air in the clouds. Over in the last book in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, we see that behold, he is coming with clouds. That's why I always like to see a few clouds in the sky. I don't like a, a cloudless sky because I'm, I want to say, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And about the manner of the Lord's coming, furthermore, I want to point out that he will come suddenly and without warning. Because Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2 to 3, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And in the next verse, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. The Apostle Peter also affirmed that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So out of the mouths of two witnesses, let it be established. However, his unexpected coming will not surprise the faithful believers who are awake and watching. Because Paul said, and this is a very important verse in the uh, it's an important passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 4 to 11, that you, if you are a believer, you're not in the dark, so that this day of the second coming should overtake you as a thief, because if you are a believer, you are a son of light, and you are a son of the day. Believers are not of the night nor of darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. What will happen when the Lord returns? Let's consider in this Bible study the purposes of his return. Well, as we look through the scriptures, we see that one of the purposes of the second coming is for Jesus, who conquered death through his resurrection, He's going to come back to raise the dead because he told us in the gospel of John chapter five, verses 28 to 29, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. And those who are alive at the Lord's coming, which I'm hoping to be, hallelujah will be changed in the twinkling of an eye in an instant. And we will be clothed with immortal bodies and incorruption 
and we will, according to Paul's revelation in the great 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in which he discusses the resurrection, we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul emphasizes that also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verses 16 to 18. Now, a second purpose is that Jesus is coming back to judge this world and to punish evil. Hallelujah. The wicked are not going to get away with their evil deeds forever because God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world and everything that's been hidden will be brought to light. It will be a day of perdition, a day of utter destruction of ungodly men. This is what the Bible teaches. And who is God's appointed judge? Jesus Christ will be the judge of God because we are told that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things we've done in the body, whether good or bad. And the standard by which Jesus will judge will be the words that he has spoken and that are carefully recorded in this Bible. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him, meaning himself. And the word that I have spoken, the same my word shall judge him in the last days. That's why it's so important to know his word and to live by it. Those who don't know God and who have not obeyed the gospel will be punished. This is just the gospel truth with everlasting destruction. This is sobering biblical truth that you just don't hear nowadays, but I want to give it to you because I have a responsibility as an evangelist to tell you the truth. Those whose names are not written in what the Bible calls the book of life, according to Revelation chapter 20, will be cast into a lake of fire. Oh my. Well, what are the signs of the second coming of Jesus, of when he's coming back? Not as the meek and mild lamb, but as the roaring lion of Judah and the judge. Well, he said, Jesus said that the world would be having birth pangs. If you've ever given a baby or if you've ever seen a woman give a baby, you know that she has increasing birth pangs. And Jesus used this as a very good example of how they increase as a birth is about to happen. So he says there will be birth pangs on this earth that will be a sign that he is coming. And he spoke this in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 6 to 8. He predicted, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed because these things will happen and the end is still to come. But then he said, as these birth pangs increase, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places all over the earth. And all these are just the beginning, he said, of the birth pains. It's difficult to keep up with all of the examples of nations that are fighting and kingdoms that are fighting one another. And earthquakes, have you noticed, are like an everyday occurrence now. The most expensive earthquake in history, they say costing an estimated $235 billion, was the nine-point quake in Japan in 2011. The Lord said that these birth pangs would be the early warning signs of the approaching end of the age. And Jesus said, when we see these things begin to happen, we are to lift up our heads and look for him because he said that our redemption is drawing near. Well, a second big sign the Bible teaches is that Israel will be back in her own land in the Middle East. Now, anti-Semites are proliferating all over the world today, and they resent the fact 
that there is a Jewish state. But let's listen to the word of God on this important matter. Let's turn to Ezekiel 37, which is being fulfilled in our lifetime. And here the Lord says, Behold, in verse 21, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they had been driven, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And furthermore, uh, let's listen to Ezekiel 36, um, 8 to 12, in which God speaks to the land and he says, You, O mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people, Israel, for they will soon come home. I am concerned for you and I will look on you with favor. You will be plowed and sown and I will multiply the number of people upon you even the whole house of Israel. The towns that were not inhabited will be inhabited, and the ruins of Israel will be rebuilt. God says, I will increase the number of men and animals upon you, and they will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as in the past and make you prosper more than before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will cause people, my people Israel, to walk upon your land. They will possess the land and you will be their inheritance. You will never again deprive them of their children. Well, in 1948, when Israel took its place among the nations of the world again for the first time in nearly 2,000 years, Students of Bible prophecy recognize the fulfillment of the primary sign that the end of the age is upon us. Jesus indicated in his Olivet Discourse that some people who were born in the generation when this happened, when Israel was reconstituted as a nation, would still be alive when he returns. Well, some Bible verses indicate that an average lifespan is about 70 years old. And since more than 60 years have passed since Israel became a nation again after being absent from the land for a millennia, we have real biblical authority to believe that the end of the age is surely coming upon us. But there is a third and very important sign of the second coming of Jesus. And that is that Jerusalem, Israel's capital, must once again be in Jewish hands before the Lord returns. And this prophecy was fulfilled during the Six-Day War in June of 1967. Let's look at the Olivet Discourse of Jesus as recorded in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24, where Jesus said, They speaking of the Jews, will fall by the sword and they will be taken captive into all nations. Did that happen? It did happen. Forty years it happened after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he said, Jerusalem will be trampled down under the feet of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In that verse, the Lord prophesied the reunification of Jerusalem as a Jewish city, that it would be a sign that foreign Gentile influence over his land was finishing. Fulfillment of this prophecy began in 1967, and scholars saw it as another major sign that the end times truly had begun. Now it's on course that Politicians are crying to divide up Jerusalem. It's right on schedule according to Zechariah chapter 12. Most Israeli leaders have stood firm on a pledge to keep Jerusalem united forever as Israel's capital. But the biblically illiterate leaders of the world are just as determined to meddle with Jerusalem. The Lord said that at the end of the age, he will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. 
and all who try to move and tamper with Jerusalem will be injured by the heavy rock of Jerusalem. God says they won't be able to move it. As a matter of fact, according to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 12 and verses 2 to 3, a significant number of countries are trying to move Jerusalem and trying with the Palestinians to force the United Nations to recognize a Palestinian state in the Promised Land with East Jerusalem as its capital. And this is a spiritual battle, pure and simple. God wants justice for the Palestinians. There's no doubt about that. But he doesn't want Jerusalem tampered with. It's a big sign that Jesus is coming. And a fourth sign that I want to mention in the program today is that the Bible says a coalition of hostile nations, scholars say probably led by Russia, will attack the Holy Land. And that's according to Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 2 to 6. Let's look at these important and timely scriptures where God says, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen, fully armed, and a great horde will come with you, all of them brandishing their weapons. Persia, which is modern-day Iran, will be with them. Also Gomer with its troops, and Beth Togamarth from the far north with all of his troops. The many nations will come against the land of Israel. Scholars say that Turkey is included in these nations. Numerous historical references claim that Magog stands for modern Russia. And the other countries named in this passage of scripture form a coalition. Interestingly, many of them today Islamic. And among them is Iran, Persia, ancient Persia, a mortal enemy of Israel. And as Ezekiel prophesied, the leader, possibly Russia, will be drawn by God himself into this battle. The nations that come against the mountains of Israel will include Turkey. Now this is interesting because for years Turkey enjoyed a good relationship with Israel, but that has changed recently. Turkey's prime minister believes now that Turkey's destiny is to rebuild the Ottoman Empire, and he's cozying up to Iran and Syria and Russia. Well, what can we conclude from these signs? I'd like to ask, are you ready for the second coming of Jesus and for the rapture when he comes in the air to take the believers away from judgment? The purpose of Jesus' second coming can be summed up by his own statement in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. And behold, he said, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his deeds. The apostle Peter stated that Jesus' delay is, is only an indication of God's patience, his long suffering towards us. But be sure, my friend, that day of reckoning is coming soon. In the meantime, what should be our attitude toward the second coming of our Lord? Well, I think it should be a joyful expectation because our citizenship as believers is in heaven and we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Messiah, to come and to transform us that we may be conformed to his glorious body according to the power that he is working within us. And then I believe he wants us to have a patient endurance because the New Testament exhorts us not to cast away our confidence, which has a great reward. For we have need of endurance in these last days so that we may do the will of God and 
I believe that also he is wanting us to be sure that we are saved, to be sure that we have a saving knowledge of the Lord. And so I want to give you this opportunity right now, if you're not sure of your eternal destiny, to receive the Lord Jesus now as Savior before it's too late, before he comes as judge. Would you pray with me? Please take this opportunity because today is the day of salvation. God hasn't guaranteed us tomorrow. Let's seize the day and seize the Savior. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I do believe that Jesus is coming back. I sense it. I want to be ready. I want all of my sins washed away by the pure blood of Jesus so that I will be washed clean and not judged. I believe, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead. And I dare to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, help me also to go through the waters of baptism as a sign that I believe. It's in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Well, that prayer helps to make us ready for the second coming. I hope you prayed with me. And I'd like to hear from you about any subject, really. If you've received the Lord, please contact me. Or if you have questions, my email address is simply christine at jerusalem.com. We also want to invite you to visit our website. And you can request our free eight-page ministry magazine, Exploits, at the website, which is exploits. Dot TV. Until next time, I'm Christine Dard blessing you with the Lord's Shalom and saying, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Yeshua, Lord Jesus.